All right, hello everyone, welcome. Thanks for coming. I know we have, um, I think, five or six competing supply chain security talks, so thank you all for choosing this one. <laughs> or people online, I guess, for coming back to it. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna talk today, I'm Marina, sorry, by the way, I'm a PhD candidate at NYU. Um, I've been working on TUF for um, five years or so, and a little bit of in total as well. Um, my co-presenter listed on the schedule, unfortunately, could not make it today, so you just have me. Um, yeah, and I'm going to talk to you today about totally tough. Um, some new tooling we made for um, simplifying end-to-end um, -end secure supply chain. Secure, sorry, that's secure twice, but you know, securing your supply chain. Um, so in case you have missed it, um, these supply chain, software supply chain attacks are a, a thing that we've heard a lot about. Software supply chain, one definition here, is a collection of systems, devices, and people which produce a final software product. This is the steps to making the software. An attack on the software supply chain is when one or more weaknesses in the components of the software supply chain are compromised to introduce alterations into the final software. And we've um, seen recently a large increase in the number of these attacks in the world. Um, the report for 2022 um, released by Sonotype um, had a 742% increase in these attacks. And I'm sure when they release the 2023 report soon, this number will be higher. So <laughs> it's, um, it's, yeah, it's, it's been happening a lot. Some examples um, from the, I'll go through these very quickly, just from the, from the news. Um, seen these a lot, um, compromises to you know, repositories, to, to um, source code, to um, updaters, et cetera. Um, and the CNCF actually has a very good list catalog of software supply chain compromises with a bit of a focus on um, cloud native, obviously, but it's a nice kind of general overview of some attacks we've seen in the past um, 10 or so years. There are many solutions that many people have proposed to the problem of software supply chain security. Um, we categorize them here into kind of three general um, categories. Um, the first is evidence gathering. These are projects that focus on, you know, looking at what's in the supply chain now and doing, um, so you can do stuff with that information. So this is projects like um, Salsa or projects like the, um, the SPOM efforts where you look at, you know, what, what's going on in the supply chain. It's information um, discovery, so it's evidence gathering, yeah, information discovery is, um, you know, getting more, more different types of attestations, more information about the software supply chain. This is things like Sigstar, adding signatures, things like Guac, kind of c combining lots of different information sources. And finally, we have policy and validation. Um, this is taking the information that we've discovered and seeing what, um, you know, making, making choices about what you should be using, what, what you should be doing with the stuff in the supply chain. And one common thread um, that you'll notice when you look at all of these is that Intoto can kind of link them all together. So Intoto can be used, to, you can take this evidence that you've gathered and kind of put this into the Intoto links and, and um, you know, collect that data in a, in a, like, in, in attestations in a way that you can, can prove. You can then get those into, get Intoto metadata into your information discovery systems to learn about what happened in your supply chain. Um, and then use Intoto as well as a policy language to say, this is what should have happened and then compare that to the steps that were actually taken in your software supply chain. Um, and then as an end user, of course, you can then use Intoto. So you have all your evidence that you've gathered on the, the far right of this diagram. You have a layout that lists what should have happened. This is your policy piece. And then the actual package itself, put that together into a final product that the end user can then, you know, use or not use, depending on the, the, the policy. One piece that's missing from this big picture, it's my, a quick Intoto summary, is this idea of distribution. Where do you actually get all of this information in this final product. And we wanna make sure that not only that, you know, they're getting all of this, but they get the correct layout, the correct policy at this point in time, um, that, yeah, that it's timely, so you don't get a replay of, you know, a policy that was valid on one day, might have a compromise that's discovered, and then a week later that policy um, is invalid and we don't wanna be using it anymore. How do we know that this, this information that we got came from trusted users? How do we know who these trusted users are? And how do we ensure that this whole system is compromise resilient? So that even if any one, any one thing goes wrong, any one server is compromised, any one key is lost, we don't um, you know, 
compromise like everything in the system, right? We minimize the effects of these compromises. So I'm going to introduce an idea for how to solve this problem called TUF. The update framework, or TUF, is a, um, it's a solution that was originally designed for secure software updating. It's this idea that you can have a compromise resilient software update delivery and, and, and updating. Um, it's designed, you know, designed from the ground up with this idea of compromise resilience so that we can reduce the impact of a compromise. And if you can't reduce the impact, you can at least allow a secure recovery in the event of a compromise. Um, it's designed with a few um, basic principles, you know, it's defining it. Um, these are respons responsibility separation, multi-signature trust, explicit and implicit revocation, and minimizing individual key and role risk. I'll let me take a picture. Um, it'll go into each of these. So first of all, we have this idea of responsibility separation. And the way this works in Tuff is that you delegate, you have a different roles in Tuff, and you delegate specific responsibilities to specific roles. And so if a role is compromised, only the responsibilities of that role are compromised, not the whole system. Um, and yeah, the, 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 these different roles have a couple of different purposes. There's the idea of signing that many folks are familiar with where you just are at, attesting to the contents of an update or really any other piece of information. And then this other idea of timeliness where you're attesting that, you know, that, that, that's that idea of replay attacks that we were talking about earlier, right? You can make sure that the software, um, that you're getting the metadata and the packages that are valid today and not the ones that were valid yesterday. Um, the next one is selectively delegating trust. So if you have a, um, or I think this is, part, this, yeah, this is part of separating responsibility. So you can say, uh, um, you know, I trust um, Bob, but I only trust Bob for the alpha package that he's a maintainer of, and that's the only package that he should be signing. If there's another, um, and then there's another user who's in charge of a different package, and they should only be signing that package. Just because like a user maintains one project doesn't mean they should be like signing every package that you install necessarily. And so yeah, Tuff has um, basically a method to say specifically what should be signed by which entity in the system. Yeah, so, so yeah, Bob can't do foo, he can do prod, he can do alpha. Um, we can minimize the individual key and role risk. So if, the, um, yeah, so if any one key or role is compromised, you can um, reduce the impact of that compromise. Um, this is like a quick equation for the, you know, the academics in the room, <laughs> how, you, how you calculate the, <laughs> the, the impact. But the basic idea here is that um, if you have a really high impact role, you can use more secured keys and, and you can use these high impact roles slightly less often through things like delegation. So then you can highly secure the keys by keeping them stored offline, use physical like UV keys and other, other technologies, put them in a safe, make, make it that hard to compromise and then have um, lower impact roles or roles that need to be used more often, use online keys um, so that you can use them frequently, but then make sure that you can then um, have that all backed by these more secured keys. Next, we get this idea of multi-signature trust. So any one role, it's not just signed by one user with one key, you can actually separate that even further. So you have multi multiple different keys that have to be used to sign a single piece of metadata. And so for something like a root of trust, you can say, we want actually five different people to have signed this before we trust it. Um, you can have a threshold of the keys, so you can do like three out of five or, or something like that for multi-signature. Um, yeah, so you have a threshold of two signatures and make sure that like, so if only one key is compromised, there's actually no risk to clients because you're requiring that two different um, people or two different keys sign, sign something. And next we have explicit and implicit revocation of trust. So um, the implicit revocation comes when, so like, you know, periodically, right? This is like a, the, the timeliness idea, right? So after all keys in the system are gonna expire, you have to make sure that, you know, both, um, you know, the, the key, you know, a lost key can't be used in the long term for a compromise. And also it's a nice way to make sure that, that people who have keys don't lose them. So in the event that something does need to change, they have ready access to these keys. And the explicit revocation is built into all of the roles in the system so that, you know, if something is lost, if someone leaves a team, if something, something happens where you no longer want to trust a particular key, you can explicitly revoke that key. And then through those timeliness properties, we make sure that this is immediately evident to users. Um, so yeah, so now we, so that was a very quick background on what Tuff is, what Intoto is. 
So how does this all tie together? So Tuf, I think we talk a lot in, in, the, in the Tuf world about using Tuf to distribute packages securely. But actually, it's a broader mechanism than that. It's just a mechanism for secure distribution of stuff, of, um, um, of artifacts, I guess. <laughs> but um, one thing that Tuf can be used to securely distribute is these um, pieces of Intoto metadata. So these Intoto layouts that include your policy, as well as the keys that should be used to assign Intoto layouts and the attestations themselves. So basically, you can use Tuf as your root of trust for the whole system, distribute the, both your artifacts, your packages, and all of your Intoto metadata. And then the user only has to um, get trust in this one Tuf root of trust, and they can use that to establish trust in the rest of the system, including your policies, which will change over time. Um, and yeah, so all these layouts and the keys that you, are used to sign the layouts are distributed from more secure roles in Tuf these high assurance roles using these offline keys. And you can do the attestations, which change more frequently, and have those be distributed using online keys more easily within Tuf. Um, this has been used in practice. This is a, a diagram from a blog post um, in 2019 about a Datadog integration of Tuf and Intoto. Um, it's a little bit in the details, but the, the basic idea is there's four roles in the top left. That's, that's Tuf. And then, the, the roles in the, in the kind of bottom middle, that's in Toto. And so you can see that the tough stuff points to the in Toto stuff. It's kind of the, the, the big picture how this all works. And the stuff on the far side is the actual artifacts that are being um, signed and distributed. And now it's demo time. So um, with the help of, that's not working. There we are. Um, <laughs> sorry, let me get that. So with the help of some, um, some students, I um, put together a quick demo of how these technologies work together. And this is really where that tooling piece comes in. This is kind of a first step towards making this easier. Because I think in practice, right, in theory we know these two tools work together. It's, been, it's happened in practice with this um, Datadog implementation. But what does this actually mean for, um, for folks today? And so the, the idea of this effort is to make it so not only is this possible, but you can actually just do it automatically with open source tooling. So we start here with um, this project called Repository Service for Tuf, which is a new project for creating a um, Tuf repository more easily. And so we have, you know, we've stood up a um, repository for that. Um, and this is the, you know, the, the base level Tuf roles. So if we look here if at each of these roles, these just contain kind of the, the Tuf metadata. So the root role delegates to the other Tuf roles. So this is our root of trust. This is the thing that's backed by more secure keys and can revoke anything else in the system. Um, and then we have targets, which is currently empty. Um, and we'll get to that in a minute. We have, um, this is the timestamp. That's our, um, our timeliness rule. Make sure the heartbeat, yes, yeah, so no, no targets currently in that bin. And um, these bin rules are just um, one level of delegation from targets. It's this efficiency mechanism for really big repositories that's built into RS stuff. So we just, you, our, this repository doesn't get that big, but we're using it for um, simplicity. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is define a supply chain layout. So Alice is our supply chain um, root of trust. Like she's, Alice is the person um, in charge of our supply chain. So she's gonna define this supply chain. She's gonna define some steps. We're gonna create um, you know, the, the product, we're gonna build it, and then we're gonna have some rules about what should happen at each of those stages. Um, this is just the Intoto metadata that describes that, that pretty simple supply chain. Okay, then we're gonna, so we're gonna make that layer, we're gonna generate it, and we're gonna upload it to our Tuf repository. So if we refresh this, we see that these bins, instead of um, being empty, now contain a, this root layout. So this one contains a root layout. Um, Hopefully, yeah, and then this one contains Alice's public key. So now we have in the tough metadata, which again is backed by list things, we have um, the Alice's public key and the layouts, the things you need to verify the in total metadata. All right, next we're gonna um, actually run, run the workflow. We're gonna create the project. Oops, what's happening here? I don't know what's going on, sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry, um, where were we? We are. Yeah, so we created the project. And then we are going to build it, They're following the same steps in that layout that we saw. Um, all 
and upload it to the repository. And you can see, you know, doing each of the steps in there. Um, okay, so that is uploaded. Yeah, we're gonna look at the new version of the metadata, see that in there. Um, so now we see and the, the, the um, different versions for the, for, um, so this is just, again, yeah, three is the version, the current version of the metadata, right? And that, that um, snapshot will indicate that. So now, in addition to this root layout, we have um, additional information. So we have the build that happened, and we have the actual um, project itself, as well as um, some of the links that happened during the, the creation, um, like yeah, during the process of doing this. And now we're gonna be a client, we're gonna um, actually verify that the supply chain happened properly. Um, yes, yeah, so we're gonna, so we've verified each of the things, and as you can see, it, you know, it actually runs the verification. It actually used the um, Intoto layout to make sure that all the steps happened. Um, and it says, okay, yeah, it's passed all verification, and we're gonna now download and install it. And we run Hello World. Okay, now we're gonna clear some stuff up and see if we can change um, something in the file and make sure that this still works. I run through this one a little bit faster. Um, so yeah, we ran it again, um, kind of cleared stuff out. So now we don't have targets. Um, empty. Okay, yeah, and so yeah, we have the same layout. This is the same people allowed to do the same things. Um, push that. And then Bob's gonna check it. See that. Yeah, so they have Alice's public key like before. And is that the same file? I think I think I think this is the mistake in the demo, but you, it's, it's the same as before. You have you have the public key and you have the Intoto layout. Um, now now stored there. And then we actually do the um, make the change to the project. The person who's allowed to do it does does the change. And then we can build it, upload it, and that will propagate in the direct in the repository because we made some changes. Now we have a version six, and that version six includes the new build of the project. Okay, sorry, I should have done this part a little bit faster. Just showing that you can make changes to it. Um, and then, so the, then this one, when it's downloaded, um, you see that it also passed verification. So what happens if it, if something goes wrong? Right? What happens if, um, you know, not the correct person uploads it or someone, someone you know, the, the wrong machine is doing the build or something doesn't match up between the different steps? So that's what we're gonna look, on ne look at next. So now we have an adversary, adversary who does not have Alice's private key who wants to tamper with the source code. Um, so, and this is an interesting, especially interesting demo, right? Because this adversary tampers with the source code, but the build step actually still happens as expected. So um, this is kind of showing that even if um, your build system like remains secure, even, uh, this, this can detect a um, attack further back in the supply chain. So anyway, as you can see here, the um, hash of this package, which I think is going to highlight in a sec, is actually different here than it was in the previous version, right? Because that's because the um, attacker has tampered with, with this step in the supply chain. So yeah, it starts with BE instead of 09. So then I, when the client tries to download and verify this, they see that, um, you know, it raises an error. They say, oh no, this didn't actually verify correctly. So we verified this stuff, this stuff looks good. And then we find that, um, yeah, if it, it found this disallow and it says, oh wait, um, we didn't match any of the allow statements, we latched to the disallow, therefore this is gonna fail. Um, that, then we're gonna do some, some demo cleanup there, but that's, that's, that's basically it for, for that. Um, I think actually, great. <laughs> Um, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna go for like, we're gonna go like this. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, so that's the demo. Um, and in summary, basically what this shows is that you can use TEF to distribute the Intoda metadata to get end-to-end -end security, um, software supply chain integrity. So if an attacker manages to tamper with you know, the source code like was shown in the demo or the build step or anything else, um, this can be caught because it doesn't match the rules in Intoto. And the Intoto metadata is securely distributed to the user through TEF. So even if, um, so yes, you, can't al you also can't tamper with the distribution of the Intoto metadata. So you can't just change what that layout says and try and give that to a user to trick them. That's what, that's what TEF prevents. And the layouts and the root level public keys are signed with offline TEF targets keys for additional compromise resilience. So in the demo, we used online keys because um, it was a demo, but in, in practice, right, these two are, are the more, um, more important, more um, like high assurance roles, and those can be signed with offline keys, change less frequently, and we can get, get assurance that they are, are correct. And the tough snapshot and timestamp prevent replay attacks of all of these different pieces of the system. This is the beauty of putting it all into a tough repository is that we get Tufts prote pr protection against replay attacks, not just on the package itself, but also on all the other pieces of supply chain metadata that we're distributing this way. So I think we're ending a little bit early, so, but um, we, um, join us. So basically the, um, the goal here is to show that these projects can work together and that we're working on improving the tooling for making them work together. But I think my call to action really is that we wanna know how this would work in your supply chain and how to make it work more easily in your supply chain. Um, we have, you know, we've been working with, with various folks to make this more usable, but um, we wanna actually talk with the people who are gonna use this open source tooling, get some early feedback on how it's working um, and make it work better. So. Um, there's some links here to the different piece, different open source projects kind of related to this talk. There's TUF, there's a specification itself, implementations in Go and Python. We also have um, a couple other language implementations um, that people have written. RS TUF, this is that repository service for TUF that we used in the demo as a repository server. Um, this is kind of, this is a newer up and coming project that I think is gonna be a really important piece of this usability um, idea. And you can also contact us on the CNCF Slack to get pointers to these and other pieces of the TUF ecosystem. And the Intoto project um, has a specification, um, also open source, fully available, and the attestation framework. And Intoto is kind of where some of this work has been happening. There's this um, IT or Intoto enhancement, IT2, that kind of defines this combination of TUF and Intoto. And um, there's a lot of work happening to make this tooling more easily in that project. And so that's kind of the place where this will eventually end up when it's like fully finished and kind of upstreamed into that. The, the demo is also open source, but I think we're trying to make this really like cohesive tooling, not just a demo. Um, and Toto is also on the CNCF Slack. And um, yeah, please reach out to us. Please ask any questions now and also reach out to us um, on the internet. And we'd love to hear more about if this is working for you and any other um, software supply chain things that we can work with. So does anyone have any questions? Yes. Yeah, so the question is about kind of the relationship between TUF and SBOMs and kind of, yeah, how we get information about the supply chain. And I kind of see them as complementary. I think that um, from my understanding, SBOMs are really about looking what, at what's in your software today. And I think that this is more about um, securing the steps of what's in your software. I think you can distribute SBOMs with TUF. I think that you could, there's a, a very clear kind of linkage between um, in total attestations of the supply chain, and then salsa, not sorry, sorry, and then S bombs. Too many, too many S's in the software supply chain. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, and then, yeah, but yeah. Then the S bomb actually says um, in the end product what was in the end product. So you can see a pipeline, and there's this project called um, 
SBOMIT that's actually looking at this is how can you use this information from Intoto that you have about what happened in your supply chain and use that to then like generate an SBOM, say, in summary, this is the stuff that's in it and we know that because we have all these attestations about what happened. Um, and I think they, in some ways they serve a different purpose, right? The Intoto can be, can be verified to say what steps happened and then the SBOM can be verified to say but what went into those steps. Okay. Yeah, I think I think definitely overlap. I think I don't I don't see it as competition so much as opportunity for collaboration. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would say I think that we're definitely interested in in S bombs uh, in, in at least I am in these communities, and I think that. Um, they're a nice like summary format to say you know all the stuff that's happening in total metadata tells you a lot about what's happening but sometimes that's too much to actually then um, be human readable and be actually looked at by people so I think there's like this cohesion where you can say okay this is everything that happened this is you know the the exact artifacts that went into it or something like that so Securing the infrastructure is what uh, health is about, uh, not necessarily like uh, giving information, uh, giving you information about the software itself. So yes, there's like a, there's a lot of like uh, focus around doing. Oh yeah, there's a lot of focus around like putting metadata about software and like um, the things around software into SBOMs, but in the end you still need infrastructure to do that. And this is just a, a framework around securing that infrastructure. So I don't think there's any competition. Yeah, I, I agree with both of you. Um, so for example, um, we distribute SBOMs <clears throat> in what we do, um, and internally we have we have this attestation framework we're designing that, that is based on Toto. Um, and, you know, for end users who don't necessarily want to verify, you know, these big complex uh, pieces of information, uh, yeah, um, we we have our own sort of, we do the Intoto, we, the Intoto style, we're, we're getting there. <laughs> uh, we do the Intoto style verification internally, and then we, th that becomes a, di a signed digest. That, that, that goes into the SBOM, right? So SBOMs are kind of a place to me, right? They're, they're a place in an organization mechanism for lots of, uh, for lots of key information. Um, and Intoto and Tuff together provide like, uh, you know, a trust architecture that allows us to know, um, you know, that, that feeds that, right? It's more information for the SBOM to communicate. Okay, explaining for, for the one that has been in the beginning when no one was talking this bomb when we started these things there in the group in Germany. People are looking at S bombs completely wrong. Most of the people that talking even the conference here talking completely wrong about this bomb. S bomb is the end of the so the, uh, the information. After we have everything, it's just the declaration of data that you can collect during the parts. This is one type of data that we can collect. There's a lot of data, but there's nothing to do about SBOMS. It's providing information to SBOMS. SBOMS is just a declaration of what is coming in the end. There's nothing special about it, what people are talking about magic. No, it's not. The magic comes about the information that comes before. SBOMS is just a result. That can be bad, can be good, but it's depending on the information it collects. That's the difference. So you are correct. So you can actually give data to SBOMS, but there's nothing to do about that. All right, I think we have another question. Uh, yes, uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, I especially liked where you were detecting a uh, malicious contribution without having to sign individual commits and store that in the commit metadata. Uh, one problem with commit signing is that uh, depending on people's workflows, they might rebase, there might be a merge commit, they might force push, and then someone overwrites someone else's content. I'm wondering uh, if that uh, sort of problem is uh, addressed with uh, Intoto and Tuff. Um, it's a good question. Um, 
Yes and yes and no, I guess is the answer, right? Because I think we don't solve that problem specifically for Git. I think that there are efforts um, working on specifically the, the Git signing um, question. And I think Intoto can take in information, for example, um, Git signing. And you can create a policy in Toto that says, you know, your commit should be signed by these people. Um, but I think the other thing that you can do is just in, within Toto is just kind of bypass that and look at the end piece of the um, source code and get that to be looked at and signed in Toto, which is what happened in this demo. Um, and I think that I, I believe in the Intoto community, there's work on in GitHub Actions to create um, to create, make this happen more automatically um, in Intoto. Sorry, I wish my, my co-presenter was here. He would have a, a slightly better answer about the current work happening in Intoto. But I do know that they're thinking about it. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So uh, will this help against phishing attacks? So what happens if like an employees of an organization, what happens if their keys are stolen? Yeah, so um, I'd say yes. I think it doesn't solve phishing attacks, obviously. I think that you know the key will be lost or whatever if it, if, if it is phished, or like you can create forge a signature, for example. Um, even with things like TFA, right, there have been attacks shown that you can forge signatures. But things like thresholds and some of these kind of tough protections, thresholds, things like and revocation, can really help both reduce the impact and maybe even like get rid of the impact of a particular compromise. So if you have just one key that's compromised, but you require a threshold of two, it doesn't really matter, right? You might want to revoke that key, but in the short term, you know, you don't have any any damage done, um, and that's that's exactly the benefit of these of these thresholds and this idea of built-in revocation. Um. Follow up to that. I suppose you could also use tough to secure your messages uh, internally <laughs> you in the company, right? I I don't know if that's practical, but hypothetically, yes, you could do that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So, but this is just this is just a trust architecture that you can use the PGP keys you like, right? And they yeah, can you just can distribute the, to the, the, the PGP precisely. keys for the emails with Tuff, so you know who, which which emails should be signed by which people. There yeah. You go. <laughs> um, be a, a fun project for someone to take on. <laughs> All right. Anything, any other questions? Oh, do you want one? Okay, I have said this before, but I wanted to get it on tape. <laughs> so what if I'm too much of a dummy to understand tough, but I still want to get involved contributing and still learning about the project? Yeah, I think that there's definitely use for that. I think, and again, I think one of our main um, efforts in both Tuff and Intoto right now is improving the usability of tools. So I think it's especially important for people who don't understand Tuff to come in and try to use our tools and tell us where they got stuck. <laughs> um, so I think that's a great place to come in. Um, similarly with docs, um, it's always nice to get outside perspective on docs, things that, that make sense or don't make sense. Um, and yeah, I think those are the main things. And if, yeah, for, for folks who, do, and, and then you can also, once you do that, if you start to get more involved, you can start, you know, writing the code, writing tests, doing all of, all of the other classic contributions. I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, one more. Maybe fun question. Uh, can you secure a Google Docs folder with Tuff? It's actually, surprising. I think it's, a, it's a good question, actually. So um, I don't know that anyone has secured a Google Drive photo with, with Tuff. Um, there are actually surprisingly diverse um, uses of, of Tuff um, that go beyond even software. Um, there's this thing called the Archive Framework, or TAF, that actually uses um, tough or a, a variation of tough to secure um, legal documents and get like a historical record of those that can be securely given to people. Um, so and I, yeah, I th really, I think that's the the power of it is you can securely distribute any artifact. You know, Sigstor uses tough to securely distribute keys and their root of trust. So I think you could very easily just kind of, you know, and, and an image is just another type of data. So you just put that data, you know, into some kind of you know, condensed format, and then just put it into stuff, into a tough repo, as a target or whatever. All right, and I'll take the last couple of minutes to uh, do a couple of thank yous. First of all, to um, Adolfo here for being my um, 
ad hoc Q and A <laughs> Q and A guide. Um, also to Aditya, who um, couldn't be here today, but was very helpful in putting this together, and to um, a couple of master's students at both NYU and Purdue, Yanri and Alan, who helped make that demo that that you saw today. So I want to shout out all of them, and thank you all also for coming. <laughs>